all that Schmendrick remembered later of his wild ride with the outlaws was the wind, the saddle's edge, and the laughter of the jingling giant. He was too busy brooding over the ending of his hat trick to notice much else. Too much English, he suggested to himself, over compensation. But he shook his head, which was difficult in his position. The magic knows what it wants to do, he thought, bouncing as the horse dashed across a creek. But I never know what it knows. Not at the right time, anyways. I'd write it a letter if I knew where it lived. Brush and branches raked his face, and owls hooted in his ears. The horses had slowed to a trot, then to a walk. A high, trembling voice called out, Halt! And give the password! Damn, here we go, Jack Jingly muttered. He scratched his head with a sound like sawing, raised his voice, and answered, A short life and a merry one, here in the sweet green wood, jolly comrades united, to victory plighted. Liberty! The thin voice corrected, to liberty plighted. The L sound makes all the differ difference. Thank ye. To liberty plighted, comrades united. Now, now, I said that. A short life and a merry one, jolly comrades. No, that's not it. Jack Jingly scratched his head again and groaned. To liberty plighted. Give me a little help, will ya? All for one and one for all, said the voice obligingly. Can you get the rest for yourself? All for one and one for all. I have it, the giant shouted. All for one and one for all. United we stand, divided we fall. He kicked his horse and started on again. An arrow squealed out of the dark, sliced a wedge from his ear, nicked the horse of the man riding behind him, and skittered away like a bat. The outlaws scattered to the safety of the trees, and Jack Jingly yelled with rage, Damn your eyes! I gave the password ten times over! Let me only get my hands on ye! We changed the password while you were gone, Jack, came the voice of the sentry. It was too hard to remember. Oh, you changed the password, did you? Jack Jingly dabbed at his bleeding ear with a fold of Schmendrick's cloak. And how was I to know that, you brainless, tripeless, liverless get? Don't get mad, Jack, the sentry answered soothingly. You see, it doesn't really matter if you don't know the new password, because it's so simple. You just call like a giraffe. The captain thought of it himself. Call like a giraffe. The giant swore till even the horses fidgeted with embarrassment. Ye ninny, a giraffe makes no sound at all. The captain might as well have us call like a fish or a butterfly. I know. That way, nobody can ever forget the password. Even you. Isn't the captain clever? There's no limit to the man, Jack Jingly said wonderingly. But see here, what's to keep a ranger or one of the king's men from calling like a giraffe while you hail him? Aha! The sentry chuckled. That's where the cleverness of it is. You have to give the call three times. Two long and one short. Jack Jingly sat silent on his horse, rubbing his ear. Two long and one short, he sighed presently. Ah, well, tis no more foolish than the time that he'd have no password at all, and shot at anyone who answered the challenge. Too long and one short. Right. He rode on through the trees, and his men trailed after him. Voices murmured somewhere ahead, sullen as robbed bees. As they drew nearer, Schmendrick thought he could make out a woman's tone among them. Then his cheeks felt firelight, and he looked up. They had halted in a small clearing, where another ten or twelve men sat around a campfire, fretting and grumbling. The air smelled of burned beans. A freckled, red-haired man, dressed in somewhat richer rags than the rest, richer rags than the rest, strode forward to greet them. "Well, Jack," he cried, "who is it you bring to us, comrade or captive?" Over his shoulder, he called to someone, "Add some more water to the soup, love. There's company." "I don't know what he is myself," Jack Jingly rumbled. He began to tell the story of the mayor and the hat, but he had hardly reached the roaring descent upon the town when he was interrupted by a thin thorn of a woman who came pushing through the ring of men to shrill, I'll not have it, Cully! The soup's no thicker than sweat as it is! She had a pale, bony face with fierce, tawny eyes and hair the color of dead grass. 
"And who's this long lout?" she asked, inspecting Shmendrik as though he were something she had found sticking to the sole of her shoe. "He's no townsman." "I don't like the look of him. Slit his wizard." She had meant to say either "weazened" or "gizzard," and had said both. But the coincidence trailed down Shmendrik's spine like wet seaweed. He slid off Jack Jingly's horse and stood before the outlaw captain. "I am Shmendrik the magician," he announced, swirling his cloak with both hands until it billowed feebly. "And are you truly the famous Captain Cully of the greenwood, boldest of the bold and freest of the free?" A few of the outlaws snickered, and the woman groaned. "I knew it," she declared. "Got him, Cully, from gills to gilt, before he does you the way the last one did." But the captain bowed proudly, showing an eddy of baldness on his crown, and answered: "That I am. He who hunts me for my head shall find a fearful foe, but he who seeks me as a friend may find me friend enow. How come you here, sir?" "On my stomach," said Smendrick, "and unintentionally, but in friendship none the less. Though your leman doubts it," he added, nodding at the thin woman. She spat on the ground. Captain Cully grinned and laid his arm warily along the woman's sharp shoulders. "Ah, that's only Molly Grew's way," he explained. "She guards me better than I do myself. I am generous and easy to the point of extravagance, perhaps. An open hand to all fugitives from tyranny—that's my motto. It's only natural that Molly should become suspicious, pinched, dour, prematurely old." even a touch tyrannical. The bright balloon needs the knot at the end, eh, Molly? But she's a good heart, a good heart. The woman shrugged herself away from him, but the captain did not turn his head. You are welcome here, Sir Sorcerer, he told Smendrick. Come to the fire and tell us your tale. How do they speak of me in your country? What have you heard of the dashing Captain Cully and his band of free men? Have a taco. Schmendrick accepted the place by the fire, graciously declined the gelid morsel, and replied, "I have heard that you are friend to the helpless and the enemy of the mighty, and that you and your merry men lead a joyous life in the forest, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. I know the tale of how you and Jack Jingly cracked one another's crowns with quarter staves and became blood brothers thereby, and how you saved your Molly from marriage from, to the rich old man her father had chosen from her." In fact, Schmendrick had never heard of Captain Cully before that evening, but he had a good grounding in Anglo-Saxon folklore and knew the type. And of course, he hazarded, "There was a certain wicked king." "Haggard, rotten, ruin him!" Cully cried. "Aye, there's not one here but been done wrong by the old king Haggard, driven from his rightful land, robbed of his rank and rents, skinned out of his patrimony. They live only for revenge." Mark you, magician, and one day Haggard will pay such a reckoning. A score of shaggy shadows hissed scent, but Molly Grew's laughter fell like hail, rattling and stinging. Mayhap he will, she mocked, but it won't be to such chattering cravens he'll pay it. His castle rots and totters more each day, and his men are too old to stand up in armor. But he'll rule forever, for all Captain Cully dares. Schmendrick raised an eyebrow, and Cully flushed radish red. "You must understand," he mumbled. "King Hygird has this bull." "Oh, the red bull! The red bull!" Molly hooted. "I tell you what, Cully. After all these years in the wood with you, I've come to think the bull's not but the pet name you give your cowardice. If I hear that fable once more, I'll go down, old Hygird myself, and know you for a enough." Cully roared, "Not before strangers!" He tugged at his sword, and Molly opened her arms to it, still laughing. Around the fire, greasy hands twiddled dagger hilts, and long bows seemed to string themselves. But Schmendrick spoke up then, seeking to salvage Cully's sinking vanity. He hated family scenes. "They sing a ballad of you in my country," he began. "I forget just how it goes." Captain Cully spun like a cat ambushing its own tail. Which one? He demanded. I don't know. Schmendrick answered, taken aback. Are there more than one? I indeed. Cully cried, glowing and growing as though pregnant with his pride. Willie Gentle, Willie Gentle, where is the lad? A lank-haired youth with a lute and pimples shambled up. Sing one of my exploits for the gentleman. Captain Cully ordered him. 
Sing the one about how you joined my band. I've not heard it since Tuesday last." The minstrel sighed, struck a chord, and began to sing in a wobbly counter tenor: "Oh, it was Captain Cully came riding home From slaying of the king's gay deer, When whom should he spy but a pale young man Came drooping o'er the lea. "What news, what news, my pretty young man? What ails ye, that ye sigh so deep? Is it for the loss of your lady fair, Or are ye but scabbard in your gree?" "I am nae scabbard, whatever that mean, And my gree is as weel as a gree may be; But I do sigh for my lady fair, Whom my three brothers have riven from me." "I am Captain Cully of the green wood, And the men at my call are fierce and free; If I do rescue your lady fair, What service will ye render me?" "If ye do rescue my lady fair, I will break your nose, ye silly old gowk; But she wore an emerald at her throat, Which my three brothers also took." Then the captain has gone to his three bold thieves, And he's made his sword baith to shiver and sing: "Ye may keep the lass, but I'll hae the stane, For it's fit for the crown of a royal king." "Now comes the best part," Cully whispered to Schmendrick. He was bouncing eagerly on his toes, hugging himself. "Then it's three cloaks off, and it's three swords out, And it's three swords whistling like the tea. By the faith of my body," says Captain Cully, "Now ye shall neither have the stane nor she." And he's driven them up, and he's driven them down, and he's driven them to and fro like sheep. Like sheep, Cully breathed. He rocked and hummed and parried three swords with his forearm for the remaining seventeen stanzas of the song. Raptured, ob rapturously oblivious to Molly's mockery and the restlessness of his men. The ballad ended at last, and Schmendrick applauded loudly and earnestly, complimenting Willie Gentle on his right-handed technique. 